Hello guys and welcome back to the Motor Recon Podcast, I'm your host Adam, I'm joined again today by Rob. Um, as a lot of you will probably know, the brand new 2021 F1 regulations were announced the other day. Now, I know we have discussed this in the past when they've sort of given a brief hint of what they might be, um, but they've now done the fully fledged, all, all singing, all dancing regulations. And what they've now done is just done 10 of the reasons why they think this will improve Formula 1. Yeah, we felt this was a little better than going through all the technical aspects of the regulation changes. Plenty of people have done that, and plenty of people who know a lot more about the technical side of F1 can explain that a yeah. lot better than we could. We aren't engineers. Could. No, yeah. they, they can explain it a lot better than we ever could. However, I am an avid fan of Formula 1, and I am always curious to see what F1 believe these regulations will do. So, yeah. obviously, I'm curious to see what their reasoning behind the change, as in why they feel that this is the right way forwards for them. Yeah, and just as we've been looking through them, it is clear in some respects that they have been listening to the fans. Because mm. a lot of the things that uh, like people had issues with, they, are, they do seem to be slowly addressing, which is a good thing. And it also, I think it will obviously benefit in the future of the, obviously the, the sport. Oh, yeah. So, the first one, the F1, have gone and listed as... A greater thing for these regulation changes are better looking cars. Yes. Which, having seen the renderings or like the sort of test models and things like that, I would agree. I think they look fantastic. Very, actually. very, very big improvement in my eyes. Um, some of the things that I think may prove to be a little bit controversial or difficult with them, um, I've read these in a couple of areas. Obviously, it's very interesting when you go into the comment section of F1's posts about these cars because although there is an overwhelming, I feel that there's a positive sort of acceptance of these rules. Some things that the fans have picked up on are there's the little wheel covers of the front wheels. That obviously helps clean up the yeah. airflow of the car. It's obviously better racing. Everybody's been saying in wheel-to-wheel -wheel sort of racing, they could potentially come loose and cause a debris problem. Oh, it's like a wheel trim on a car, isn't it? When you see a yeah. car without alloys and you see them wobbling sometimes they do fall off you see them at the side of the road all the time so i have read that in the comments before so yeah. um, that was something that people picked up on uh, it is valid i think yeah because like i say little shards of that could break off and potentially shoot off and hit someone's helmet or something like that but that being said obviously if you notice down the side of the car the sideboards are virtually gone they're almost non-existent on yeah. these compared to the extremely complex and fragile bodywork that they have on the current regs I don't think it'll make any difference, to be honest. I think they're also in a place where they're not likely to come off unless you're having a proper wheel-to-wheel -wheel moment. Yeah. You can't just touch someone on the side and take those off. They're on the inside of the wheel, right on the very top. You'd yeah, have so to, the tyres are going to hit Yeah, you'd have first. to have a proper accident for that to happen, in which case, well, there's going to be debris. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. see, so yeah, you're already crashing. That's probably the least of your worries, isn't it? Yeah. Um, point two that they have actually just come on as well, which is probably the biggest thing for me personally, is closer racing. Yes. Now, it's always been my beef. I've recently, as you probably well know, recently I've found F1 relatively boring. Some of the last few races have actually been quite good. 2019 has been a... Has been a yeah. I'd actually say it's been a pretty good season yeah, it's been, on it's the been whole. It's not been bad. It's been better yeah. than, than the last few years. But on the whole, it is, there's not that much going on. Um and I'd, ra I'd much rather would see like wheel-to-wheel -wheel action or close racing like touring cars or something like that. Yeah, I think um, if you're based in the UK, I think a prime example of if you want to see wheel-to-wheel -wheel action, as in literally you couldn't put a cigarette paper between the cars, that's BTC, say oh, British hands Touring down. Cars. As in, if you, if you haven't watched any and you'd love to, I seriously recommend it. The racing is insane. Yeah, and it's probably the same like DTM in Germany and things like that. Very, yeah. very close. Normal, they look like normal cars, though, which is always a good bonus for me. You but. would even say that Formula E, for, well, yeah. for, for the faults that it has, I know that there's a lot of contact in Formula E and a lot of people criticise the sport for that, but the racing is close. Yeah, it is very Nevertheless, close. Yeah. And I think this, in the Formula 1 world anyway, will massively improve it because it will provide more entertainment for the fans. Mm. Now, me personally, it probably comes a bit weird. I, lo I like to see... Like say close action, sometimes even crashes and things like that. Not serious ones, obviously, but no. like a bit of like you know contact, that nudging, and people feeling brave enough to just go for that chance. And if they are racing much closer, they might risk more overtakes. They might do stuff like that. And 
You never well, know. Obviously, I think, obviously, I'm not an engineer, but even as a fan, I understand the fact that with the way that the current generation of Formula One cars generate their downforce, it creates a huge amount of dirty air, which makes it very difficult for the car behind to follow. Yeah. Especially when you're in a complex of corners where that's exacerbate, exacerbated worse. The new generation of Formula One cars, obviously, they generate their downforce from underneath the car largely. And that has made a huge yeah. difference. And it's pushing the air up after, at the back of the car. It's going up at a much steeper angle so the cars behind can follow much more closely. Well, obviously, there is nothing new about ground effect of Formula One. Anybody who's been yeah. a lifelong supporter or is interested in the history of the sport will know about when it was prevalent back in sort of late 70s, early 80s stuff. Yeah. This is different. I will say that. Um, one of the things is um, the ground effects cars from history had skirts. So they would seal the car to the floor, creating that area of low pressure underneath, which yeah, obviously suck it, suck sucked it, it down. Floor. But that meant that obviously when the seal was broken, obviously they would occasionally dramatically lose downforce and it made them very yeah. dangerous. Yeah. This is none of that. Yeah, so it, it mitigates that risk. And also the cars are much safer than they used to be. Exactly, yeah. Much, much safer. So they can handle it, I think, a lot better. I feel it's the right move, actually. Yeah, definitely. Because I say it's it. allows it for this much closer following. Exa no, so you it, can slipstream more. I mean, what were they supposed to do? You think about it from their perspective. The fans still want fast racing, but they want close racing. That was pretty much the only like, game left in town in that respect. Is in I... If you want to keep the speeds at a relatively similar pace as where we're at now, I've read in articles that um, it, under the 2021 regs, the cars will be approximately three to four seconds a lap slower. Yeah, which but, is fine. But that still makes them very quick. Yeah, and you're not going to notice it watching it on TV anyway. Well, what you will notice watching on TV is Christ, they're following each other much closer. Ironically, I feel that the sense of speed might be increased because of how close the racing is. That is actually true, I didn't think so about that. I, yeah. The sensation of watching it might actually be more interesting than the outright pace that's going on. Yeah, which to me is better, because like I say, BTCC aren't fast, however, it feels like when they go past that like 17 at a time, yeah. like, oh, 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 that, that is a good sense of speed. Which yeah, you don't exactly. Get here. So yeah, I would actually, yeah, I didn't think of that, it's probably a good point. Um, the third one they're doing is obviously more chances for different teams to score podiums. Yes. Now, again, more Formula One fans will know it's very much a Mercedes, Ferrari, some, yeah, Red, Red Bull. Bull. Red yeah, Bull, yeah, yeah. Three, they're the top three yeah. teams. Three horse racing at the moment. They're the ones who seem to be getting all the podiums, getting all the glory. Yeah. So to get other teams up there, I, of me personally, I really want to see McLaren get back up there, and I think this is their chance to do that. Um, Williams again. Yeah. I know you're a big fan of Williams. It'd be great to see them back up, with, back up at the top. Um, and obviously making it a more fair sort of racing thing and give more people opportunity I can't see that as a bad thing no and obviously uh, we'll go down to the cost points later on but um, having a closer racing formula will allow for those circumstances to get yourself a podium if you're a midfield team yeah. it makes it more likely because you're closer together if you're uh, yeah. 30 seconds down it doesn't really largely matter what happens up front you never or if you're a lap down like a lot of the, most midfield teams end up getting laps well you've got no hope of getting a podium yeah out it's of just that. not gonna happen unless no. everybody in front of you crashes which is never exactly happen. no it's one of those isn't it yeah often the most interesting races are the ones where um Think back to Max Verstappen's first win in Formula 1. That was Barcelona 2016, I believe. Yeah. When the Mercs took each other off on the first lap. That took away the monstrously... The cars with the huge advantage. And it was a great race. Yeah. Because everybody was more closely competitive yeah. together. And, that, and that's what they think they're trying to go for. And they've also said at point number four that they want driver's skill to be front and centre. They don't want the car doing all the work. And obviously having a much better car that aids the driver better or suits their style, this is going to be, I think, great for them. I might add as well, this was something that recently reared its head um, with the Renault F1 team. Yeah. Um, there was a brake bias system that was deemed, for whatever reasons, worthy of um, penalisation. Um, so, yeah, I do believe that F1 are really committed to that. As in... Well, when you look at even the current crop of F1 cars, it's not like they're sure they have a lot of technology on board, but the actual aids that help the driver are relatively limited in a lot of ways. It's no anti lock brakes, for example, traction control's not in there. So, yeah, yeah, I think that it's always been on the mind. Yeah, and I think it's great that now finally addressing that, which again will probably make for better racing. It'll give some of the uh, drivers in the lower teams who actually have the skills but don't have the car to 
sort of produce, I think that'll bring them up to the front again. Sport isn't sport without people. Yeah, the exactly. The thing is, if there's no people involved, such as human skill, whether it be the engineers on the weekend, the pit crew or the drivers, it's just a technical demonstration. Yeah. What makes it a sport is having people involved. That's part of it. And obviously, you've got Robo Race, which is one of the supporting categories for Formula E. And as thoroughly impressive as it is, it's not a sport to me. There is no, a, there's no humans there's involved. Not, well, so. there are. There are engineers yeah, involved, but there's no not. human in the car as well. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. which, again, if it's a computer doing the driving, it's not, not worth it, in my opinion. Uh, number five is tighter aero testing rules, um, which obviously to close up the pack, mm. which, again... No, no qualms from me. I think that is a perfectly reasonable uh, problem to address. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you think back to the sort of early two thousands, um, testing was largely unfettered. I mean, when Michael Schumacher was dominating it in sort of the early two thousands formula. Um, testing would just go on like they'd go round and round and round and round and the big teams had the infrastructure and the money to just test the cars to oblivion yeah break it essentially if you need big. this is taking this one step further because yeah. not only are they restricting the amount of testing you can do on track which as we now know testing pre-season testing is extraordinarily limited now very they're yeah. also testing what you can do in the wind they're yeah. also limiting what you can do in the wind well they're reducing well. the time as well yeah. overall you can spend so again if you're trying to develop something you haven't got much time it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good for that because then you might get halfway through it and then you're stuck with what you've got. But it promotes innovation as well in the teams. Yeah. They now, knowing they have such limited time with the wind tunnel, they have to make it count. Yeah. They're, it's one of those things. It makes, again, that human element of the sport, it encourages that sort of teamwork and creative thinking. The things that we like about yeah. Formula One, I mean, a challenge. A lot more of it will go into like um, simulated computer programs and things like that, which... Is fine, but it'll never be the real thing, will it? So, I'm all for yeah, that. that unpredictability. Yeah, that you're stepping into the unknown, taking it onto the track because largely, if you've done the vast majority of your pre-season testing in either sort of uh, computer dynamics or, let's say, in the wind yeah. tunnel to a limited perspective, when you roll it out for pre-season testing, that's the first time you've seen it fully in action, up to speed. Yeah, anything could happen. Yeah. It's brilliant. And yeah, I'm, no qualms from me. I think it's a brilliant idea. Uh, point number six was pass fern changes to mix up the grid. Now, I do. I didn't really understand this one too much, but I know you've read this in a lot more detail than me. Yeah, um, by the looks of it, they have to, um, in, in sort of long short of it, they have to commit to the car that they'll be running for the weekend earlier. Okay. So what they've basically, they go, that's what we'll be running. Yeah, okay, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where part Ferme comes in. No more changes. That's what you're going to be running. Again, it adds to the unpredictability. Okay, not... Because you've sort of locked yourself into what you're going to do. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And also, that's, a lot of people could, like say, shoot themselves in the foot from day one if they've not quite done enough. But as you say, it says it here under point six on the F1 website. Uh, they, because it says, for example, um, if a team brings a test item to the weekend, they're going to either have to commit to it running it all weekend or run something else for both free practice one and two before taking it off and saving it for next time. The point is, you have to commit to what you're doing. Okay. Okay, that's actually, that, that's actually really good. Yeah. I do like that. Um, probably the one of the best the best ones, again, I've already seen things in videos of people getting around this, but number seven is a cost cap to check mm. over spending. That is fantastic for the smaller teams, obviously, because now they limit it to $175 million per team, which is what it's going to be, um, and per year as well. Now, so it's, uh, it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of this sort of, uh, sport. Now, to be fair, they have a follow-on article specifically about the cost cap point going into how it'll be enforced, because I think a lot of people, um, as good as it sounds in theory, and believe me, I think it sounds great in theory, I think people are always dubious of how well it'll actually work in the real world. You yeah. will get creative thinking that will try and work their way around that. Well, the, the one I've already seen, which actually was from Nico Rosberg, um, was he was speaking to, um, I don't know which team it was, he didn't actually say, probably for obvious reasons, Yeah. but he was saying that they're going to put a lot of their testing down under a road car budget, even though it'll be testing for the F1 car, which means it's good because, like you say, the technology will be then in the road car as well because I think they'll have to do it. Well, again, but, that's part of making it more, continuing to make it relatable to products yeah. people actually buy. But 
that's the way they're going to get around it because there's still a loophole in the rules, which means they can actually do that. Yeah. Now, that's good for, like, Mercedes, Ferrari, McLaren, things like that who have road cars. Yeah, but what if you're Williams? Exactly. Yeah. Or any of the other smaller or teams. Or what if you're yeah. Haas, yeah. for example. Who, who don't yeah. have that team. So I think if they're already starting to figure these rules out now, obviously, like, a year and a half prior to this coming in force... They might have to close that loophole. Yeah, to be fair, but maybe that's that, the whole point in announcing it so early. This yeah. does give F1 a chance to obviously see how there are potential ways around the rules and maybe plug out the ones that they're not thrilled with. Yeah, cause I, yeah. I don't know if these are the final, final, final ones, but I, ho- I hope they will plug that gap because I do think it'll then it would be unfair. Because they say Mercedes and Ferrari have a much bigger budget then, and they have the big road car division. Well, that would largely, if that be the case, then that would also largely alienate people like Red Bull, for example. Well, yeah. And although they have a partnership with Aston Martin, that's not their road car division. No, but I suppose if they're using it as a sponsor, they could do it via the sponsors. That like, will give you this yeah. money to do it. I'm sure they will find a loophole. Exactly. Yeah. No, they're they're far smarter people than myself, who are probably thoroughly on the case with this. Yeah. Well, like doing it line by line. It's been announced for like yeah. what two like two days, and they're already finding all the loopholes, and they're already getting around it. So they're gonna. I think they're gonna have to close that out eventually. But nonetheless, it's good that they've put a cap in there try and at least make it fairer Mm -hmm. for these smaller teams. Um, Point eight is shorter weekends to ease the pressure on teams. Again, I think it's a great idea. So uh, a little while back, how it used to be was um, they had Thursday practice as well as Friday. Yeah. So it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There still is a Thursday on the agenda, but that's largely committed for things like uh, media interviews and uh, press conferences and things like that. Um, So what they're going to be doing is they're just going to make it a three-day weekend now formally. So essentially, it'll be a Friday, Saturday, Sunday job. Okay. Because they're adding more races to the calendar, obviously, they do need to ease the pressure off it. I think it might have been Max Verstappen a little while back who said, um, he mentioned it in an interview that he felt sorry for his team because obviously you got to think about the people who work in the garage. You're, it's a long time away from your family. Oh, yeah, exactly. And with more and more races on the calendar, that's less and less time they get to spend at home, you know, kids, whatever. No, I, I, yeah. I get it. And like you say, you've got to have that good work because even when you're not at the track, you could be spending a day or two getting there and all the trucks, getting all the equipment sorted. The logistics kind of, Yeah, the logistics behind so, F1 is actually massive. So I'm all for that. I think it's good. I mean, there is an argument to be made that um, they do run the risk of making the schedule too compressed because yeah. there is obviously the case for, well, obviously three days a week means, you know, three day a weekend means you get the Thursday to do whatever. But um, if moving the press conferences and, um, y- you know, all of that sort of, and the interviews over to the, to the Friday means that those three days actually become a living hell, I don't know what I prefer. Would I rather yeah. to have four days where the pace isn't quite as breakneck, or would I rather have three days where it's just madness? I think three days of madness would suit me better. That's the thing. I think that's entirely up to personality. Yeah. Or I'd say it depends how slick your team is as well and how Again, good they it are might fav- It might favour the bigger teams with more people. It's worth a try, though. Yeah, I think it's, worth I think it's good to definitely give it on there. Um, number nine was a, obviously a greater focus on young talent, which this one I actually do like, because what they're going to do is um, they, all teams will have to run a driver with two Grand Prix or less experience for at least two free practice sessions per season. Yeah. Now, that's going to be good, because you're going to get, obviously, the smaller, younger talent coming up. You'll get to see the potential much earlier. Yeah. And, uh, and scout, them, scout it for the bigger teams. The thing is... Um, I like, obviously, I like Formula 3 and Formula 2, but obviously, we're all, we are all got lives and we've got things we need to do, so do actually dedic- <laughs> <laughs> dedicating the time to watch all of those formulas over a weekend just isn't feasible for most people. No, and yeah. The thing is, though, the first time I often get to see that young talent from F2 and F3 is once they're in a practice session or whatever in an F1 car. Yeah. So I think it's good to give them that airtime. 
Oh yeah, I'm for sure, and because it's going to be every single team forced to do this, we're going to see lots. You're going more to see a lot more yeah. of it as well. No, I agree, and obviously it also gives those teams the opportunity to appraise how well those young drivers are uh, handling an F1 car and all sorts of other things, and it also gives those F1 drivers the opportunity to give it a go. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and really, te- well, a lot of them will probably come up through the team's driver programs. Yeah, sure. So again, they've obviously seen them in lower classes, but they'll give them chance to actually experience an F1 car and see how they can handle it in comparison. And I might add as well, something that I've just thought about now as far as this point is concerned, um, obviously having to run those young drivers um, might encourage other teams to have young driver programs. Yeah. Because if you have to run a young driver, isn't it beneficial to have someone within your structure go in there? Yeah. So that's a good, that's great news for the future of the sport because it means it's not just pay drivers coming into F1 who have the money behind them. It's potentially young talent who've been spotted by teams and have yeah. signed them onto their programs, like Red Bull, for example. Yeah, I know McLaren do it as well. Exactly. If but if everyone has to run those young drivers, maybe it will make it even more of an advantage for them to actually start their own programs. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. I'm all. I'm all for that. I think it's actually a good thing. Uh, the final point they've come on, which is even more opportunities to hear from drivers and team bosses. Now, this to me, I'm not really bothered about. This is obviously the interviews and stuff around it. I hear a lot anyway. I yeah. feel Like I get great access largely. Yeah. I don't have a problem with this as it is. Obviously, there's never too much. I guess sort of that kind of stuff. But. It, I'm not really bothered. I don't care what team principals have to say in many cases. I just like to watch the race. I'm not into all the back-end stuff. I know people are, and for them, this will be fantastic. No, and but, don't get me wrong. I, I think that driver access is quite good at the moment. I don't think that's necessarily a huge problem. No. I think team principals um, is a bit more of a difficult one because you get ones who are highly engaged, such as Christian Horner, for example, who often comes on Channel 4 and will do events with yeah, the yeah. hosts whereas you get other ones who don't necessarily do well, they, they all might, that many interviews they, they might so. do on their home TV channels like, I know Christian Hall obviously being British we see him a lot on English TV yeah true um, yeah, exactly. and obviously because he's probably around in this country a lot more he speaks the language fluently so they, other guys might do it but just in their home Home countries. I mean, I would, but say for example, yeah, no, I would like to hear from all of them, though. That's, oh, a, yeah. I, I think that's the aspect that I would like to hear more yeah. of. Team bosses. I mean, me personally, that's not a big deal for me. I just like the race, and that's it. I don't like the build up. I don't watch any of the practices or anything like that. I know you can not say I'm, I don't like it or anything like that. I just like the race. No, that, no, that, exactly. and I'm sure there are plenty of other people, as yeah. you say, because especially if you've not got the time to watch all the free practice, you well, know. Yeah. I mean, who has the day? Who can commit an entire day to things when well, you've got it, other yeah, stuff I mean, to sometimes do? sometimes a full weekend. Exactly, yeah. All right then, well, that's it. I'm actually excited for 2021. Yes, very much so. I think it... I think it'll really get me back into the sport because I'm starting to lose interest now. But it's I think, no, but I think it'll yeah. get a lot of people into it to begin with. Clean slate. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. like a new start. So I, I'd go with that, and I, I actually am excited. It's one more year to go, and mm-hmm. um, obviously, as it comes through, we'll give you our opinions as and when that happens. Um, so, just a little second topic we we're going to talk about is because at the moment I have got a Nissan Leaf, yes. the second gen one. It's from work and everything like that. I just have it for the weekend and over Monday. Now, I was a bit sceptical at first. I've never driven a full EV before. No, neither have I. Um, I've had a passenger ride in one, but I've never driven one. I thought, what on earth is it going to be like? I was very sceptical, obviously, as you know. I love my manual gearboxes, I love my petrol engine, I love the sound. I've been pleasantly surprised. Oh, as you say, I obviously had a quick nausea day out of curiosity. And genuinely... I quite like it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's a second-gen Nissan Leaf. Um, for those of you who don't know what it's like, obviously, it's not to everybody's taste, but compared to the first-gen, it's a massive improvement in terms of looks. I don't I don't think it's a bad-looking... No. So, let's put it this way. It's certainly a damn sight better looking than the um, I, BMW uh, i3. i3. Oh, yeah. yeah, massively. And in the spec that I've got, Silver and black yeah, two looks tone good. actually does look quite good. Yeah. Um, range, when I got it, 100% charged, was 233 miles. Now, my journey home, um, obviously, it's the first time I've ever driven an EV, so I've been a bit playful in some respects. No, but it's also, I think um, it takes time to get used to as yeah. well, doesn't it? So you understand the... It was it was fast. Yeah. For what it is. Like, yeah, yeah. It's not rip your head off fast, like a, probably a Tesla Model S P100D or whatever, but it's quick enough. Like, mm-hmm. it puts most 
normal cars, I think, to shame because it's just instant. As soon as you touch that accelerator, boom, you're off. Right, okay. Um, and that was an eco mode. Take it out of eco mode. It does fair fly. Um, I used about 10% charge getting home. Just and I was being a bit silly. But last night I went and picked um, my mum up from an event and it literally in about a six mile journey round trip it used one mile of range okay which i don't think is too bad um i'll see the i'm doing a proper test with it on monday when i actually take it for a long drive yeah uh, to work to the reason i've got the car um so i would i'm so far pleasantly surprised i enjoy it it's comfortable inside it's got all the equipment you could ever need mm-hmm. and it's absolutely silent which is the freaky bit yeah uh, which obviously you'll see soon um, so what we thought we'd do is just have a look around. Like, if you were interested in electric cars, obviously these are expensive, new. These start from twenty nine something. Was it twenty seven something for the? I believe they Nissan. started at twenty seven nine nine five for a brand new Leaf in the particular model. You're that, looking at twenty eight. Yeah. yeah. So we thought, hang on a minute. These cars, obviously, not many people can afford that. Fair enough, they might get it on finance, but whatever. So what they're going at for the second hand market? So we looked the. For second gen Nissan Leaf seemed to come around to some point on the 67 mm. plate car, which in the UK is 27 to end of 2017. Yeah, second half of 2017. Yeah, be- well, it's it? between, yeah. between uh, September 2017 and March 2018. But we found one here. It's the same spec as the one I've got, just all black. It's done 13,600 miles. Which you wouldn't is, call that long. No, it's no. on an 18 plate, so it's the beginning of 2018. And it's up at the moment for £20,400. That's nearly eight grand. Well, yeah, and that's the saying that if they if they spent any ticked any options when they bought it new, it would have been even more. I will say, looking at what you got on the car configurator on Nissan as just sort of your standard twenty eight grand, it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, you wouldn't be complaining. No, be you wouldn't be complaining. complaining I wouldn't be anything. complaining about it. So you get things that. like no. keyless entry, your touchscreen, parking, parking yeah. assist, um, all that fun, like a, a smart cruise control sort of keep the distance from was the it car apple carplay and Google i don't Android, think it has that sure? standard okay no right, okay. um it is the base model like you probably will get it on the higher ones but it doesn't on that one anyway okay right um but i'm not overly fussed for that no it's neither not, i can play yeah. my tunes through anyway as long as it's yeah. a way to bluetooth it does. Well, it then, does. Yeah, so it's, then, it's not yeah. the end of the world um but so yeah been pleasantly impressed so in just over a year it's lost nearly eight grand worth of its value yeah which <laughs> It's good, but like we said, we were discussing off camera uh, and off microphone, sorry, that this, you can't charge a premium on a second-hand electric car. No, we both said that because the actual market for people at the moment who are willing to buy is s- smaller than the electric, than an internal yeah. combustion car and, market. And also as well, like, see, when I go and buy uh, maybe a second-hand normal car, or it's a pet combustion engine car, you look for certain things, you listen for certain noises, you like, you can check certain things, check oil and all that kind of stuff. I know there's a lot less on this, but what do you actually check? Because I don't—it's a step into the unknown. Yeah, I don't think you can check battery degradation. It'd be great if you could. They might have a way of doing it. I said, I've never bought one. Be, but, no, as you said, I, I, that would be a useful yeah, thing to have. They might have it in the car on the little. Yeah, exactly. System, if you, but, but that's because if you knew where to look, then that's perfect. Because yeah. Sure, and I'm assuming online there will be that guidance now. Yeah, hopefully, and someone I, will. Because if you say, sure, I'm assuming there will be Nissan Leaf Gen Two Honors clubs, for example. Who will be like, you know, what should I look out for if I'm buying a second-hand one? And maybe yeah. they can give you some advice. And that that sort of worked for me. Um, I think that's the questions I would have. But there's, so we also looked as well a bit more slightly more premium market in the way. Tesla's obviously at the moment is probably the biggest name in the electric car market. Yeah. Um, there were some Tesla Model Threes that are, they were brand new because they've only just started really selling them in the UK within yeah. the last twelve months. Um, so not that many around. But in the second-hand market, we say second-hand one had done eight miles, so it's new. Um, they're going for like forty four, forty five thousand pounds and up. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we looked at a Tesla Model S, um, SE, uh, which is the eighty five one, five door. So this particular one is twenty four team reg with sixty five thousand miles on it. So this is the sort of time when I'd be looking at. I'd be curious what battery degradation would be like in that. That's yeah. when I'd be curious. But these. I know the, the, this generation in particular are very expensive new, yeah. very expensive, um, but they're now going down, the, this one in particular one is £31,990. Yeah, about th- but about 32 grand, yeah. Yeah, which again, it's a 2014 car. But it might add, it looks like it's It brand does look new. immaculate, and it's got like electric panel, roofs, electric seats, heated seats, all the things you'd expect, but again, how, how do I know going in to buy that car 
what am I looking for? Truth be told, I genuinely do believe the best thing you could probably do is consult the Tesla forums of owners. Yeah. Because they're the people who live with them. They're the people on a day-to-day basis know about any of the common niggles or well, issues the, the, that the, you can This have. one you would hope, because back, back then, this is when Tesla, in the nicest possible way, had their problems. They were getting on the feet. Yeah, yeah. with build quality, with some reliability issues, and quite a few of them caught fire. Yeah. Um, so... I don't know if they had any recalls that could potentially have fixed some of these niggles, but I say you'd have to just look around on the internet, find forums, find owners, and see what you actually are looking for. Yeah. But I just found it interesting that you can look at these cars that were brand new in some cases, yeah, that were actually quite old and also very expensive, but they are now becoming affordable for a lot of people. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, as in you would argue that, I mean, another one, for another time, I'm assuming we'll probably have a look at some of the budget electric cars yeah, on the second-hand bit, bit market. Cheaper, so yeah. Things like the Renault Zoe, for example. We'll save that for another episode, but I think that'll genuinely become more affordable for your everyday sort yeah, of person. Well, I think they're already quite cheap anyway. I mean, I'd love a Twizy. That would be my little dream, run, nip around. Well, if, you, if I lived in a city, then, yeah, that would be an yeah. ideal situation. So, yeah, that would be it. I'll, I'll, after I've had it for a bit longer, I might do a proper bit of more of a yeah in-depth sort of talk about the leaf just how i've experienced how it was to experience it and um, but for now i think it'd be a good place to wrap it up yep um we will be back next week again for a, another episode um so we'll see you again then uh, again all the links to social media and things are in the uh, little description below so you can get in touch about anything you want us to talk about and um, but for now we'll see you next week yeah see you later guys see you later bye bye